I'd like to present the few announcements to you this evening while we turn to our passage today. The passage will be in James chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. So while you're turning there, it's a few announcements. We have dinner after service tonight. They're preparing food for everybody over here. And it's the, my whole idea is to have fellowship together. So please, if you're not in a hurry somewhere, stay back behind and enjoy fellowship with us. On uh, Wednesday is our Bible study, it starts at 7 p.m. each week, and Thursday this week is a ladies' fellowship beginning at 10.30 in the morning. Friday we have Kids Club at 4.30, it's a wonderful ministry for young children. If you have young children or uh, you know of young children, you can invite over here, they'll really enjoy themselves and they'll learn a lot about the scriptures. 7 p.m. we have our youth and young adults meeting, that's every week, and we praise God for those who are attending. <clears throat> All right, um, James chapter 5, verse 7 and 8 for this evening. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience waiting for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye there, be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Let's please bow for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word with those people, Lord, who are in need of counselling, in need of direction and guidance. And it's your word, Father, through which you speak to us from. Give us a grace to have ears that are open to ear this evening. May our hearts be ready, Lord, and receptive to receive your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Tonight's subject is one that I need very, very badly, and that's all about patience. I don't have much, I never had much all my life. Impatience is me. That's me. As an unsaved person, constantly. I'd never walk, I'd run places. I, that, that's just me, the way, the way God made me in my, okay, sinful nature, but that's the way I am. And it's always been a battle for me to try and calm down. And that's very, it's, like an, it's an impossible battle if I don't focus on it and be disciplined. Otherwise, I'm at it again. And I don't think I'm the only one in this bucket. I think there are other people also here. So this is not for you. Please just pray for me, okay? Otherwise, I'll pray for you too. Ecclesiastes 8.11 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. When something's done wrong, if you don't come down straight away and stop it, you'll keep getting worse and worse and worse. So that's motivation to get stuck into things and don't let them drag on and on and on. But unfortunately you find out God allows things to go on and on and on and on. That creates impatience on the part of the person who's waiting for God to intervene. Now in Psalm 94, <clears throat> the beautiful psalm, I just want to just give you a few verses out of it. In Psalm 94, it's speaking about a time where the Jewish people are either in captivity it could be in the time of the judges where you find they're beset by enemies around about and they're saying, God, how long? In verse 3 and 4, Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things and all the works of iniquity boast themselves? He says, how long, Lord, will you put up with this thing? Why, why, why? And then God answers, I who create the ease, can't I hear what's going on? I, who made the eyes to see, can't I see what's happening? I'm the one who judged, don't I judge wicked people? And I'm the one who knows their vain thoughts. You think, I know what's going on? Sure I do. Then the psalmist says, God, you're righteous. You chasten in the right times, Lord. You deliver people in the right time. You never forsake your people. You restore your people. So we, we find out that when God comes along and he's patient, patient, patient with evildoers, we think, Lord, Why? Just cut them off. Why? Then he tells you, the Lord, he's not slack in his promise, as some men count slackness, but he's long suffering to us would. Not one that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is so patient with us sinners that he keeps on working and working and working with us, even though we seem to resist, resist, resist. He's patient. Now, God wants us to be patient also with people who are sinners, just like he's patient with us. <clears throat> we're told in the Old Testament how Israel were in Egypt for 430 years and a lot of that time they're praying and praying and praying and praying and saying, God, send us a deliverer. 
So God sends them a baby called Moses. They want a deliverer, so this baby's born. Well, how long before he can grow up and do something? Oh, 40 years. Then he grew up and he became a man and became a leader. But he did the wrong thing. So he had another 40 years in the wilderness. So now he's 80 years old. And now God starts to answer their prayers. So we find Israel are praying, Lord, we're in bondage, we're suffering, this is misery over here. 80 years after, God says, okay, here comes Moses. Here comes the ten plagues. Here comes deliverance. Now, they had to wait and wait. And then he said, you beauty, promised land, two weeks away. So God takes them down to Mount Sinai. Wrong direction, Lord. We're going to the desert, not to the promised land. Ah, but I've got to test you. I've got to try you. I've got to humble you. I've got to make sure I prove you. I've got to instruct you. I've got to disciple you. So that takes time. You're not ready for the promised land. That takes time. So you find with each of us who have a sinful nature that God has to work in us. And the Bible says, Romans 5.3, Tribulation worketh patience. In other words, you want patience? God says, no problem. I'll give you tribulation. Why? The result of tribulation is patience. What do you mean? I'm going to force you to be patient. It won't happen naturally. It's got to be forced upon you. Doesn't sound too good, does it? In that passage over here, we have um, the, uh, Jew, the Jewish people, Jewish believers, were scattered about the time of the stoning of Stephen. They went all around the world trying to make, the, make good. Some did better than others. And the rich had forgotten the fact that their poor brethren, they're supposed to help them out as much as possible. Instead, the rich are abusing the poor brethren and making them as employees and won't pay them their wages. They're made wages. And the employees, they turn to God and crying out to God, saying, God, we've got nothing to eat. And God hears the cries of them and comes down in judgment upon the rich, but not immediately. Sometimes it takes a bit longer. And so James is saying over here, people, we understand what's going on. God knows what's going on. But all this is going to work together for your good. And one thing it's going to do, if nothing else, it's going to teach you patience. It's going to teach you faith. It's going to teach you to wait on me. Because if you try and get things done yourself, you'll fall into a bigger hole. It's going to teach you something. Patience. With patience comes faith. Now, I've got three suggestions to this evening on uh, how to learn how to wait patiently. And these three are absolutely true. They work. I mean, they really, really work. I've tried them myself, and I keep on trying them. I keep on applying them. First thing is this. If you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, somehow everything else diminishes. Very simple. God will promise never to leave you nor forsake you. He promised to meet all our needs. God can take, people can take everything from us completely, but never God. He is the only person in the world that will never ever lose when you trust Christ as Saviour. You'll never lose God, never. So you realise, Lord, you are the only one I can really count on. So when everything is going wrong, you turn to him again, finished. And that's why God allows things to go wrong, to get us to turn to him. Now in Hebrews chapter 11, you have all the heroes of faith in the Old Testament. Those guys who suffered greatly for Christ and they stayed for God's word completely. And then in chapter 12 verse 1 it says, Now, we're beset by all this great cloud of witnesses. Let us run the race. Let's do it with patience. Let's lay aside that sin that has easily beset us. And let us look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and set down the right hand of the throne of God. Let's look unto Christ who went before us, and he suffered like us before us, and was patient. So you want to learn patience? Look to Jesus. So we find, as we look to Christ, we realise God is in no hurry to do what he has to do. A thousand years with God is like a day, and one day like a thousand years. He's not in a hurry. He's not time-oriented. He's goal-oriented. He's concerned with quality, building something that will last completely, not some rush job that's going to be destroyed later on. And God looks upon us and realizes, boy, I've got a big job to do. Looks in our heart and sees a sinful nature. He sees in our heart a desire to want to keep our sins but not suffer the consequences. And God thinks, well, I have to do about that. I'm going to have to work on you. Like a potter who's going to try and, and uh, work with some clay so he can uh, make something good out of it. He's got to get the hard lump. He's got to put it down. He's got to smash it, smash it, smash it. 
you've got to put water over it and drown it, drown it, softened up. He has to cut it with a wire and open up, see what's inside the thing. Small impurities, get it down, bash it, bash it, bash it, bash it, cut it, look inside of it, a bit more water, and same thing again and again till it's soft, moldable, and pure. is right. Now I'll start to make something out of it. That all takes time. But without that time, you can't make anything. So God is the potter working with us, cutting, moulding, banging, forcing, pressurising, watering, till we become yielded in his hand. So when God allows tough times to come in our lives, do not cry, thank you, Lord. If you didn't do it, I'd stay hard as can be and go far from you. Always thanking for what he's doing to you. Never, ever, ever think, oh, it's not fair, God. No way in the world. Keep your eyes on the Lord absolutely at the shadow of a doubt. I was witnessing to a guy in Sydney some time ago, and he had several problems and everything. And I said to him, tell me, <clears throat> these problems were severe. And I said, what if you were told that there's a remedy for your problem, but it'll only be available to you in about three years' time? How would you feel? Yeah. I said, yeah. Be ready for you for three years' time. What do you think? Well, I suppose I'd be more patient, wouldn't I? Exactly. First Corinthians 10, 13. What does that Bible say there? First Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted, but that you're able. But with the temptation, also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Oh, so God put a limit to my testing. Sure. It's going to end. Sure. Where's my guarantee? God is faithful. Rest. Relax. Finished. So if we take God's word seriously, we realise, hey, what am I worried about? Everything's going to be okay. God will work things out. So we'll find out very, very plainly, the Bible says over here, <laughs> very lovely, it says that the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Now, the, the, the writer here, uh, James, is saying, look, if all else fails, when you be with Christ, that's the end of all the trouble. And you know something? As you rake up a few years on your list, like I've done, actually look forward to it. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 said, Lord, this body of mine, he calls it a tabernacle, is wearing out, man, falling to pieces, pain, scars everywhere. I can't wait to get my brand new body from heaven. I can't wait. Now, that's an anticipation that is godly and that is good. And God puts in our heart saying, now, you've got cause to wait for me. Why? Because what's coming up is far better than what you're losing behind. Far, far better. Now, you're a person, if you're a person of the world, and all you think about is things here and now, that's not very comforting. It's not comforting at all. But if your affections are set upon things above, not on things of the earth, that sounds real good. And God is working not to make our lives more comfortable over here because we're sinners. We sin all the time. And God has to rattle us up and shake us a bit to say, look, you're comfortable in your sin. I'm going to have to disrupt that a little bit. I'm going to have to stir this up a bit. So you're not comfortable in your sin anymore. So you start to resist it. So when you find going through a whole lot of time, thinking, Lord, I can't take much more. Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. King David, when he came back from, um, he was going to go fight a war with the Philistines and didn't eventuate, so he came back to his home in Ziklag and he found that the city had been burnt completely. All the wives and, and the children and flocks and herds had been taken away. And in warfare, you know, you think the worst. Yeah, they must be. Everyone's killed. Maybe those who are still survivors have been bruised badly, but that's it. They've lost all their families. And all the men of David were in tears. They wanted to kill David because they were just so, so hurt. Well, he went to God and he comforted himself by going to God. He said, God, shall I pursue these people? God said, pursue them. Will they recover everything? God said, recover all. So go into God's word. Somehow comforted his heart and gave him hope that everything would become better. Now he lost everything. The whole city's burned completely. His family's gone completely. All the possessions have gone completely. Him and his men. But now he had hope because he turned to the Lord. And God gave him this hope. And so then he got up there. They pursued after the enemy. They found them. They destroyed them. Brought back everything. They lost nothing. Nothing was lost. 
Now, in warfare, how many times do you have a battle and no one gets killed? How many times? Like, never. This one, never. No one got killed. All the loved ones were brought back completely. All the possessions regained, plus some. As a matter of fact, David got so many, so much possessions uh, from the... Um, uh, from the uh, Malachites, the, the spoils from them, he gave so much to many, many cities in Judah. He had too much for himself. You might think, well, it might get too much to bear. That's why the God says, casting all your care upon me, for he careth for you. In, in Philippians 4, 6 and 7, the Bible says, be careful or anxious or worried for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made unto God in the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. One day, we'll hear a sound of the trumpet, and it'll be time to go home. One day it'll happen, if we don't buy die before then. Our job until then is continue in well-doing. For the Bible says, you will reap if you faint not. Now, we should never, ever let, never let hard times make us deviate from our, our walking with the Lord. Never. So when hard times come, go close to the Lord. I think it was Hudson Taylor said, Problems are never an issue. The, the issue is where you put the problem. If you put the problem between you and God, that's, the, that's an issue. It separates you from God. If you put the problem on the other side of you, it draws you closer to God. So the issue isn't problems. They're not trials. It's what do you do with them. If you make them draw you closer to God, you win. If they draw you away from God, you lose. Have a husband and wife, okay? They get married. They're one. Problem comes. If it goes between them, they fight. On the outside, they draw closer together. The principle is simple. Problems are not the issue. Trials are not the issue. That's what you do with them. That's the issue. So we find first, we're supposed to keep our eyes on Christ. And then next thing over here, keep your mind on your calling. In this passage over here, it gives the example of a farmer. A farmer has to go out there and plough and plant water and weed and wait. Waiting is most of what he does. He has to depend upon right weather conditions. And he, has to, uh, he knows there's many problems out over there, but he can't do a thing about it. Well, as far as the problems go, he could be planting seed, and birds could be eating all the seed he's planting. He could be going out there and planting seed, and winds come in and blow all the, all the, um, we, uh, all the winds come in and blow all the weeds under the sun into his uh, crop. He could be planting seed, and fire comes over and burns all of his harvest. He could be planting and doing his utmost to raise a beautiful crop and locusts come in. They've had locust plagues some 20 kilometres wide and 8 kilometres in depth, in length, come right through. When they come through, nothing is left behind. Nothing. These happen. You find some farmers, what they've done, they see the locusts coming. When the locusts come in, they burn all their fields. Hopefully... Most of these locusts will die and they won't lay new eggs for the next season and come on in for new locusts around. So they destroy all their crops. They, you can't save them. It's impossible. So you might as well destroy them and the locusts with them. Famine comes along, nothing grows. You had the uh, time when Joseph had um, gave the interpretation of the Pharaoh's dream. He said, you'll have seven years of good years and seven years of famine. And all the good will be forgotten completely. The good will be forgotten completely. You go from one year, productivity next year, nothing. I had a fantastic fig tree at home. It's still there, maybe not for long, and used to bear fantastic figs every year. This year, not a one. Not a one. I'm thinking, cut it down. Not a one. That's frustrating. And you have farmers, and they're working, 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 nothing happens. I had a friend in uh, Wagga Wagga. He had a farm over there, and he grew... Uh, 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 wheat and had sheep over there and in a time there was a great big uh, overabundance of wheat in the market the price went all the way down he said you know something he says what i've got to borrow money to put in all this seed over here what i get back is less than what i borrowed that's less than what i borrowed but i've got to keep on borrowing what's that what else do i do what else do i do so for many years you go and borrow do it have a grow his crops do everything he's supposed to do sell it for a very low price and if it rains on the crops, <laughs> it's gone. It becomes animal food, far less. So for, for, for a uh, farmer, he has to have a whole lot of patience and a whole lot of faith in God to make sure his crops bear properly. 
And then you might have thieves coming through and stealing. Well, so his whole idea is this. The Bible says now, he waits patiently all the time. And plus that, he can't sow until the first rains come so the ground will be soft enough. And he can't go and plough until those rains come. And he can't go and harvest till the crop matures. And the crop may mature if the latter rains don't come in later on too. So a lot of things happening that he can't do. He's stuck. Well, that's just part of the farmer. He has to wait. Not wait on circumstances and cross his fingers. No, waiting on the Lord. Because he's looking at the Lord and he's waiting for the Lord and life's the same. We don't get everything we want when we want it. That's not the way God operates. Psalm 27 verse 14 says, Wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. God did not rush. Now, what do we do while we're waiting? Very simple. In John 15, the Bible says, Abide in the vine. While I'm waiting, I just stay close to Christ. You don't have to wait for that. You do it any moment, every day. I will stay close to Christ. Have my devotions, have my quiet times. I meditate upon God's word. I stay close to him. I talk to him all the time. Stay close to Christ. Also, I've got, the, I've got the great commission to fulfill. God has given me the commission to tell people about Jesus. I don't have to wait to do that. Every time I meet someone, the opportunity to share my faith with them. Also, we're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ, which means we're living for Christ. We're examples of Christ. I don't have to wait for that. Also, we're supposed to follow Jesus Christ at home, at church, at work, wherever it may be. So we find while we're waiting for these so-called things we want, there's a lot we can be doing. We could be continuing in our calling for the Lord to serve him under the circumstances he's placed us in. We don't have to have a pure, pure uh, situation to work with God. When I was working in Goulburn, I was doing a lot of work out in the fields in, um, in landscape gardening. If it was raining, I'm still there. If there's frost, I'm still there. Like, ow. Oh. When it's in summertime, the flies are crazy. I'm still there. I don't wait for a perfect environment. And when there are snakes about, I'm still there. You see snake skins all around the place. Think there's a snake skin, the, the mother ain't so far away. And so in that situation, you've got to still be there. You can't pick a perfect, a perfect situation and say, right, when it's perfect, then I'll go and do my work. No. Circumstances never stop us from fulfilling our calling. It's faith that says, just despite those things, keep on going, keep on going. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, while he's in jail. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize, the high corner of God in Christ Jesus. I keep my mind focused on the corner that God has given me. I'm in jail. Okay, fine. What are you going to do in jail? Well, I've written a couple of epistles, some letters, and these letters happen to become God's word. God, God, they were actually scripture, he didn't even know about it. And he was able to encourage many, many people in jail. He witnessed all those households of, uh, of Caesar when he was in jail. So this guy didn't waste his time. He's in jail, waiting to, be, waiting to be released. Five years waiting to be released. And in his time, he's witnessing. Witnessing different uh, Roman governors, witnessing different people around about, witnessing. So you can continue, even though you're under difficult circumstances. Okay, first thing we find, keep your eyes on Christ, then... Keep your mind on your calling. The last thing, keep your hearts in the word of God. It's so very, very important. The Bible says, establish your hearts. Make sure your hearts are strong in the word of God. Christ will come soon enough. Until then, be strong in the Lord. Very simple. Now, we're told in Romans 12, 1 and 2, the very first thing we're told, according to the great wonderful gift of salvation is given to us, present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God, which is our reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, this is the very first thing we're doing. Establish your hearts on the Lord, give God your life. And in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, now watch out, put on the whole armour of God. Why? Because Satan's around to cause you to fall. These temptations that are coming around to you, all these problems, they're not going to make you fall. It's what you do with them will make you fall. And if you're not prepared properly with a spiritual armour, you can fall flat on your face without, not unnecessarily. I mean, if I got the shield of faith, his temptations won't harm me. If I got the sword of the spirit, <laughs> he can't stick around me. Helmet of salvation, he can't hurt me. Breastplate of righteousness, boy, 
my testimony for Christ will be so strong that any, any lie he makes against me will be, will be diffused completely. So we find if we have the spiritual armour on, man, aren't we ready and able to put off all these difficulties? And then in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be steadfast, unmovable, always, always, always abound the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. Be steadfast. Now, that steadfastness does not mean when everything is nice and clear. No, you pretend you're a bulldozer. A bulldozer laughs at what's in front of it. Why? Because it digs right through it and levels everything out. So pretend you're a bulldozer for Jesus Christ. And most importantly, in 1 Peter 4, 8, it says, Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall um, cover the multitude of sins. When we get tested and tried round about, many times the testing comes from fellow believers. Ooh, frictions. Maybe husband and wife, maybe kids and parents. And so we have over here, above all things, have fervent charity, fervent love, because that is so, so important. Christ said in John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know you, my disciples. You have one love one to another. That's very important. So you demonstrate this forgiveness for the brethren round about, and you're demonstrating the love of Christ. And that is so important, having victory in our, in our life today. We have three things over here that help us, be, help us maintain patience. Keeping your eyes on Christ. Keeping yourself focused to, and to fulfil your calling that God has given you. And keeping your hearts in God's word. Christ is going to come soon enough. And he won't be late. And when he is, he wants to find us watching and waiting by doing the Master's will. Not by grumbling and complaining and whinging and carrying on. It's so very important. Jesus Christ should mean more to us than our circumstances do. His will should mean more than our, my will. And my life should be simply here to, to exalt Christ and not for me. I should, be care, I should care about more what people think about him than what they think about me. Absolutely. So with that, that type of attitude, you find problems are small. Now, I'll show you something that Paul said. Now, we all know what he went through. This guy has suffered a whole lot. I mean, this guy was beaten and whipped and stoned and, and uh, shipwrecked so many times and chased from town to town. In verse 16 of chapter 4, 2 Corinthians, he says, Which cause we faint not, but though our outward men perish, though outwardly our body gets weaker and weaker and weaker, Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For things which are seen are temporal, but things that are not seen are eternal. So Paul said, you know what gives me the grace to go through a situation and uh, all the difficulties? It seems to me light because my focus on what's coming up, not on what's here. And what's coming up is far richer weight of glory than what's over here. So I'll keep my mind on what's ahead. I'll keep my mind on God's word. I'll keep my mind on spiritual things. And don't worry about the temporal things of this world. God will take care of those things. Trust in him and he will. So patience is something that is developed through tribulation. God sends a tribulation on purpose to teach us patience. On purpose to prove us and try us and see, what am I going to do? Will I turn to the flesh or I trust God in the spirit? Let's be up for prayer. Our loving Father and gracious Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us, your love for us, Lord. He never leaves us nor forsake us. Thank you, Lord, for the trials that we go through. Even though they don't feel good, we know they do us good. Help us, Lord, then to go by faith, to praise you even in the time of difficulty, to allow you, through faith, Lord, to wait upon thee, May we learn patience, Father, and that wonderful, meek and quiet spirit that so honours thee. We thank you in Christ. Now we pray. Amen. The last hymn is number 389.